thank you very much. Thanks a lot for this, um, this uh, wonderful invitation, this opportunity to share with you some of our uh, work in Latin America, specifically uh, in Venezuela. Um, Venezuela is, um, is one of our highest uh, priorities in the uh, Western Hemisphere. Um, but we also follow very closely conditions, human rights conditions in, in other countries like Mexico, for instance, Central America, uh, Brazil, where we have an office, and uh, Colombia, just to name some of the, uh, of the countries that um, concentrate uh, our attention at Human Rights Watch. As you know, Human Rights Watch is a non-governmental human rights organization. We um, uh, made a serious effort to go cover human rights conditions all over the world. Um, uh, I am responsible for the work of Human Rights Watch in the Western Hemisphere for several years, more than two decades. Um, I have been unable to find something more interesting to do. Um, uh, nobody has offered me a better, better job so far than to um, uh, supervise the work of Human Rights Watch in, in Central South America and the Caribbean. Um, what we do is um, to collect information, to um, gather um, evidence, uh, usually in the field, uh, with our researchers, and based on our own um, investigations, research, and, and, and documentation and evidence, um, we, uh, we assess uh, um, uh, human rights, uh, what is the status of human rights in, in uh, close to uh, a little bit more than 100 countries in the world, obviously including the United States. Um, and uh, I will report on those, uh, on those findings. We made specific recommendations, uh, and we try to influence uh, public policy, uh, foreign policy, um, to put some pressure on, uh, on those governments who are responsible for human rights abuses. And when we see progress, and we see we are able to, to confirm um, positive developments, obviously we encourage and we acknowledge and we give uh, full credit to those um, um, uh, leaders who are actually willing uh, to, to make some progress on, on human rights. We use all the international mechanisms uh, of human rights protections established. We go to the UN. Um, this week, for instance, the uh, uh, Human Rights Council of the United Nations is um, uh, hopefully is going to pass a resolution for the first time ever against Venezuela uh, for its human rights uh, record. We have been pushing, pressing, and providing information and justification for that resolution. This is extremely important uh, development because um, Venezuela has been, uh, has managed to use its uh, um, considerably uh, economic and political muscle and, uh, and capital to avoid uh, real scrutiny at international level. And um, uh, in spite of the deplorable human rights record of the country, uh, uh, Venezuela has never been subject of a serious uh, scrutiny and, and, and judgment and evaluation by the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Uh, so for the first time, uh, there is a very good chance uh, that uh, the members of this um, of the Human Rights Council, with the classic exceptions of uh, um, dictatorships who are on the side of Venezuela. I have the list and it's, uh, of those ones who are against this resolution. It's, uh, it's a very revealing group of countries. It's pretty embarrassing for any, uh, any country in the world to be supported by this small group of uh, uh, dictatorships in the world who are in opposition of any kind of resolution criticizing uh, Venezuela for its human rights record. Now, if this resolution is passed, the, uh, the next step is that the Human Rights Council is going to demand and request from the High Commissioner for Human Rights a specific report on Venezuela. So we enter into a new phase where we, start, we are able to start targeting um, 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 uh, resolutions and reports on a country that deserves actually 
global attention for its um, uh, poor uh, record on human rights. Now, um, uh, this September is, uh, for me, uh, an important uh, month because it's uh, the 10-year anniversary of my uh, arrest and expulsion from Venezuela uh, after we released a report um, in, uh, in Venezuela. I went to Venezuela several times before that. I met with the officials. The, the, I met with President uh, Chavez a few times and with members of his cabinet, Vice, Vice President, Minister of Interior, uh, Mr. Diosdado Cabello, etc., and the Foreign Minister, and so on. So and that was uh, several times uh, where we, the, the, the we were reporting uh, uh, serious setbacks on, Venice, on, the, on the human rights record of, of Venezuela. But the last report that we did was September in 2008, was actually uh, something, I, I think, I guess, unbearable for the government of Venezuela. So they intercepted me and my colleague, Daniel Wilkinson, um, uh, at the hotel after we, uh, uh, we uh, uh, gave a press conference that, conference that was uh, broadcasted live by CNN and several other international media. And they uh, arrested, they packed our, our um, luggage. Um, we arrived at the hotel and we found that uh, the, um, they, have done, uh, they have entered into the room already and uh, a group of around 35 uh, security officers uh, with, uh, you know, uh, um, with weapons and the classic uh, um, um, uh, uh, operation of uh, of security forces, and they force us uh, to to leave the country. Fortunately, we arrived in Brazil, and um, and we were able to uh, to inform uh, to the world of what really happened after we released this report, um, assessing uh, a critical with a critical assessment of human rights uh, conditions in Venezuela. After that one, President Chavez justified the expulsion by arguing that um, uh, any foreigner who came to Venezuela to trash the uh, Bolivarian revolution will receive the same treatment as uh, uh, the Human Rights Watch delegation. Mm -hmm. They even passed a law that uh, uh, bar um, 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 international um, organizations or, or foreigners to travel to the country and to produce reports that uh, criticize the record of the government. Now, uh, we are Looking into um, a case of um, today of um, uh, conditions in a country that there is tremendous concentration of power. I mean, there is no no uh, a single independent official or institution in Venezuela capable to prevent abuses, to investigate abuses, to to punish perpetrators of uh, of human rights abuses in Venezuela. Everything, everything in Venezuela, not just the military, everything else, the judiciary, the uh, prosecutor office, the ombudsman, uh, with the only exception of the, of the Congress, the National Assembly, Parliament, everything else is under tight control by the executive branch, by uh, uh, the current uh, head of state, Mr. Nicolás Maduro. Now, um, Venezuela is, um, is a case of a, of a, of a government that uh, engaged in uh, systematic human rights abuses that includes uh, uh, massive detention uh, with no due process, uh, arbitrary detentions of, um, of opposition uh, leaders, opposition members, of uh, students, uh, of, like you, members of civil society, of journalists, anyone, union members, union leaders, anyone who crossed the line, who is considered by the government as um, a threat for the security of the government, and that is a, actually a very lax uh, concept, uh, could be sent to prison by the um, security service, by the intelligence uh, service. If you end up uh, participating in a public demonstration, um, we have been, we were able to document hundred and hundred and hundred of cases of uh, 
um, uh, uh, good examples of excessive use of force, uh, uh, brutality. Um, the um, security forces have license uh, to shoot uh, with no, no uh, um, to anyone, to civilians who are demonstrating on the streets, as well as um, uh, uh, civilian gangs uh, called in Venezuela colectivos, who operates uh, with the same type of uh, license. They, those are um, uh, delinquents uh, associated with security forces with the capacity to arrest anyone, to produce that person to the um, National Guard or the police, or the army, if the army is uh, um, involved in that uh, repression. And, uh, and that person, while is uh, detained or in detention, uh, either in a military installation or, or police installation, uh, is subject of, um, of uh, usually uh, cruel and inhuman treatment, and, um, including torture. Um, so um, the human rights abuses that we are facing in Venezuela are the result of an official policy. This is the government that um, um, react with brutal repression against those ones who dare to challenge uh, peacefully, democratically, or try to exercise their fundament fundamental rights. Um, in other words, the abuses that we are able to document in Venezuela are not the result of isolated incidents. It's not a case of uh, some either soldiers or police officers who engage in some sort of insubordination, you know, um, are clearly committed uh, by multiple security uh, forces in multiple locations and with the, uh, at the instigation and with the tolerance and the endorsement of the authorities at the highest level. One good news, important development, is that the uh, chief prose prosecutor, the chief prosecutor of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, decided to open a preliminary investigation back in February against Venezuela and also against the Philippines. That was back in February. And today, uh, this morning actually, six uh, democracies from Latin America, that includes Canada, Chile, Argentina, Colombia, Peru, and Paraguay, have, have, uh, they have uh, announced that they are today filing a petition, a complaint, independently of the chief prosecutor of the ICC, but before that same office, the chief prosecutor of the, of the ICC, on grounds of uh, the, um, uh, the fact that uh, the Venezuelan government, according to these six governments, democratic governments from the region, is responsible for the commission of crimes against humanity and other crimes that are under the uh, jurisdiction of the ICC. This is an unprecedented um, action. There is, uh, you know, you're not going to find in the history of um, international human rights protection and specifically the record of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, an action that involved uh, governments pointing to uh, and filing a formal complaint for human rights atrocities before the ICC against the government of Venezuela. Um, there, I, I do believe that, um, that this pressure, uh, legal pressure, is important and is, uh, is a way to uh, isolate that regime and to hopefully um, uh, thanks to this type of actions, um, force the government to change course. Um, as you also probably are aware, uh, I believe yesterday or a day before, the uh, Trump administration announced additional sanctions, individual sanctions, against uh, top members of the government, including the wife of the dictator, Nicolás Maduro, um, a group of five or six were uh, selected this time. But there are many government officials in Venezuela who have been um, selectively uh, sanctioned by the European Union, as well as Canada and the US government. Uh, and these sanctions, by the way, 
has been applied during the Trump administration as well as during the Obama administration. Uh, these sanctions essentially are freezing, uh, you know, are, uh, you know, uh, translated into um, um, efforts to freeze assets and um, and and visas uh, for um, individuals of the, uh, I mean, top officers within the judiciary, the military, and the executive branch uh, that uh, are responsible for uh, corruption, uh, narco-trafficking, money laundering, um, as well as uh, human rights abuses. Um, we hope that uh, Latin democracies will replicate the same methodology and start uh, uh, applying sanctions, specific targeted sanctions against uh, uh, those ones responsible for human rights uh, abuses in Venezuela. Now, in addition to this very dark and very um, sad record of, uh, of uh, atrocities uh, committed across the country by security forces as well as these civilians who work uh, closely with, uh, with, um, uh, with the, um, uh, the National Guard of Venezuela, in a context of full impunity, zero accountability. There is not a single, by the way, member of the security forces who is uh, um, serving time in prison for, for human rights abuses. In addition to this uh, record, uh, you need to add another uh, component, which is actually extremely relevant, and is the humanitarian crisis that Venezuelans are going through today with uh, um, really uh, dramatic shortages of uh, food and medicine and vaccines, which explain the massive exodus, the massive immigration uh, of Venezuelans uh, from Venezuela uh, since 2014. Since 2014, the uh, uh, UN officials has been able to register, and this is the cases of, there is documentation, of uh, 2,300, I'm sorry, 2 million 300,000 Venezuelans who has uh, uh, leave the country, flee con uh, you know, the, the, the Venezuela, and they are um, going through the rest of the region, the rest of the countries in Latin America, seeking essentially refugee, refugee status for uh, um, their conditions in Venezuela. Most of them, very likely, are leaving Venezuela for, as a result of this uh, 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 humanitarian crisis that the country is, uh, is going through. One of the most serious um, 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 factors that you have to keep in, in, into account is that the government of Venezuela is in full denial of the uh, humanitarian crisis. The Venezuelan government argued that uh, there is no such a humanitarian crisis. As a matter of fact, they organized some propaganda events to show that Venezuelans are trying to come back to Venezuela. And, uh, and the Colombians, actually, Colombia is uh, today, um, 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 uh, according to the uh, records, I was recently in Colombia, I went to even the border um, with Venezuela in Cúcuta, uh, there, according to the official records, there are around a million Venezuelans in Colombia today uh, uh, seeking, uh, you know, uh, better life and to try to reestablish themselves <coughs> in uh, in Colombia. Um, I have to tell you that uh, Latin America in general, and that includes Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, m our sense, based on a recent report that we did. Uh, is that uh, the region has been uh, quite generous and, um, and, and open and receptive to this uh, massive uh, immigration of, um, of Venezuela as a result of this, um, of this um, uh, internal debacle uh, from a social and economic and security perspective. Um, they are trying their best the governments of regions to offer these Venezuelans uh, some degree of protection. And uh, the, there are two instruments that are, two legal instruments that they are using. The uh, uh, 1951 
refugee convention, but only few of them probably qualify under that, uh, the terms of that convention. And the 1984 uh, Cartagena Declaration, which is, in, at least for many of these countries in Latin America, are part of the domestic legislation. So uh, in general terms, they are getting some uh, support and protection and opportunities. But, um, but actually, they could do more and better. And our, one of our proposals is that um, uh, Latin democracies, including the ones, the countries that I just mentioned, Brazil, Ecuador, Chile, Peru, etc., cetera, um, should try to come up with uh, uh, a consistent and uniform approach, uniform policy. Because um, so far, we see a lot of discrepancies between one country and another country. In other words, for instance, for uh, a working uh, permit in Peru, uh, conditions are very different in Argentina for the same working permit. Uh, for those ones who want to, uh, uh, to, to, to get uh, their degrees, their professional degrees, they are journalists, or they are you know, uh, uh, lawyers, or, 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 or nurses, or dentists, or whatever, and they wanted to practice their profession, the rules of the game change according to uh, different countries. So um, our position is that uh, it should be an effort, serious effort, regional effort, to try to uh, create the same type of legal framework to offer a chance for the, the kids of these refugees to go to the school and to, for the families to have uh, access to um, health and um, and, uh, and the protection that they, they need and they deserve. Obviously, this is a very serious uh, issue, very compli complex uh, problem. Um, I don't think there is uh, any uh, experience, similar experience of a massive exodus of, uh, of from a country of the, the kind that we are witnessing uh, of Venezuelans in the rest of our region, individuals, I mean, poor Venezuelans who just decided to walk out of, literally, walk with their family uh, from Venezuela to Colombia and then Ecuador, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are following um, Venezuela very closely. We have uh, um, some specific recommendations, but I'm happy to stop here and to have some um, you know, uh, conversation and, 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 and to answer your questions, if I can, um, uh, with regard to this. Um, um, actually very, very uh, serious case that, uh, and challenge that Venezuela represents for the rest of the region. Thank you. Um, what, I, what I wanted to ask you is that you mentioned that uh, five countries are taking uh, Maduro to the International Criminal Court, yes. in other words, uh, uh, um, Canada. Uh, high, uh, high six countries in Six countries, yeah. Canada announced Canada today. Canada just Today, that's, that's, can you uh, talk us a little bit what happens afterwards? So what, what uh, because we, we also read that the uh, U.S. is leaving the ICC, etc. So um, what is what is the legal sure. and, and maybe political significance of the ICC? In this okay. Well, first of all, I think it's um, it's a shame that during the same the first the same week that we are seeing uh, Latin democracies plus Canada to uh, approach the ICC and request an intervention of the ICC in Venezuela. Uh, the Trump administration, Trump himself, delivered um, an outrageous speech at the UN. And his secu national security advisor, Mr. Bolton, going after the ICC, exactly the same tribunal. And the, the position of the current administration is that if the ICC uh, decided to investigate any American citizen or, interestingly enough, American ally, uh, the Trump administration is prepared to take uh, action against those judges, individual judges of the ICC. I mean, uh, uh, sanctions against each one of them. Uh, so. Um, Obviously, it doesn't really help that uh, the Trump administration, when you see, again, 
in the, the same 48 hours, the, you know, 36 hours, uh, the uh, um, uh, a group of countries applying to uh, requesting the intervention of the ACC. Uh, you have the Trump administration time, trying to uh, attempting to uh, intimidate uh, and to denigrate uh, the maximum tribunal for human rights in the world. Now, what is the practical consequence of this action? Your, your question. Since the chief prosecutor of the ICC uh, has already opened a preliminary investigation back in February against Venezuela, um, what could happen here is essentially two or three different scenarios. The chief prosecutor could take this new complaint that is coming from these uh, six countries, again, unprecedented, there is no record or something like that, but uh, according to the rules of procedures, the chief prosecutor to take this complaint and join that one with a preliminary investigation that she already opened uh, back in February. And as a result, she could make a determination. And that determination is to, I know that this is not going to sound too sexy or dramatic, you know, but, uh, but it's a big step, believe me. Uh, she could take the determination to move from a preliminary investigation against Venezuela to a full investigation against Venezuela. You know? And um, that, is always the, the, that is always the normal procedure. But as a result of this new petition, uh, she could decide to do that based on the merits of this uh, request and based obviously on the, um, the fact that uh, it's unprecedented that you have six important countries from the, hem the same hemisphere going after another one for human rights abuses. So that could be, and that would be extremely important. Now, if the chief prosecutor decided to open a full investigation against Venezuela, uh, she doesn't have the, the obligation to request, I will, the technical language <coughs> is, is too boring, so I will say, you know, in these terms, she could bypass the chamber of the ICC of the court and open a full investigation. Normally, she will require the blessing, the authorization, the, uh, she will require that a group of, uh, a chamber of judges should concur with her on that decision to move from preliminary investigation to full investigation. Now, full investigation means that we enter into a new phase where um, she is able to issue arrest warrants no, against individuals. Remember that the ICC go after individuals. Not about, it's not about Venezuela as a state. It's about those ones who are directly involved or responsible or are in a position of power and have and there is evidence that they have been endorsing this kind of atrocities. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a whole new ball game, you know, and, um, and, and, and hopefully this is going to uh, help to put some additional pressure. One last point on this uh, investigation by the ICC. There is another country that for fully justifiable reasons has been under the uh, scope, the attention, the radar of the ICC in this region, and that is Colombia. Colombia has uh, been under preliminary investigation by the ICC for a really, really long time, more than a decade. And, um, and, and, and there are reasons that fully justify that investigation by the International Criminal Court. But there is one big difference between Colombia and Venezuela. One major difference. In Colombia, you do have independent judiciary. You do have independent prosecutors and judges who are courageous enough to investigate uh, human rights atrocities, including when those atrocities are committed by security forces. And there is plenty of uh, evidence that shows that the Colombian justice system is very slow, it's not a model, but is capable and, some, and many times able to go after those ones involved in human rights atrocities, which is not the case of Venezuela. And that is an important factor that you need to bear in mind if you're going to calculate the time for how long Venezuela is going to be under, let's say, preliminary investigation or full investigation by the ACC. It will be under, under that kind of investigation and attention 
as long as the chief prosecutor believes that there is a chance for a domestic, credible, rigorous, impartial investigation into human rights atrocities committed in Venezuela by security forces. My answer is that there is no chance, there is zero chance of an independent, credible, uh, rigorous investigation of uh, human rights atrocities committed by security forces. Thank you. And let's open it up. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for visiting. My name is Francisco. I'm from Venezuela. So, from my point of view, there's like a mismatch of your diagnostics and your prognosis, right? Because you're calling Venezuela a narco dictatorship. You're calling Venezuela. I wrote it. Uh, I didn't say that. Uh, that's involving narco trafficking, uh, systematic violation of human rights. There are not isolated incidents. That's your diagnostic, right? And then your prognosis. You're basically saying that. The solution is the ICC, which hopefully will make the government change their policies. So if a government is violating human rights and is doing all these things, as you correctly point out, what needs to happen in Venezuela for Human Rights Watch to call for stronger actions? For what? For stronger actions towards the government of Venezuela. What do you mean by that? Can you elaborate? Yeah, I mean, plenty of solutions that have been when in the table, more foreign, not intervention, but more foreign pressure on Venezuela. But so far, I can call it anything of that, right? So Human Rights Watch is basically asking, it's basically asking for non-intervention from outside to Venezuela. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, let's be clear. Uh, I don't, I mean, a fundamental principle of international human rights law is the principle of universality. In other words, there is no um, chance, there is no right of any government in the world, of any kind, of any ideology, in any location, to argue that uh, in the name of uh, sovereignty, they could engage in uh, human rights abuses and they don't have any kind of accountability to the international community. So that is usually the concept of um, non-intervention on the internal affairs. It's exactly the, 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 um, the uh, um, raison de uh, uh, raison d'être. The, the, uh, right. the, 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 the reason why we have uh, an international system of human rights protection is because we don't believe that, uh, that uh, inside the borders of the country you could do whatever you, you can or you want with your citizens without international uh, responsibility. So uh, we are, uh, in the case of Venezuela, we are actually fully engaged with the ICC ourselves. We have been providing information for a long time to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, to every international mechanism, we are pretty much behind this resolution at the, at the um, Human Rights Council uh, this week. We have been um, um, in, in, uh, engaging with the Inter-American System, the American Human Rights Commission and Court, to address the issue of Venezuela. I have testified in the U.S. Senate several times in favor of sanctions, individual sanctions. Uh, which means uh, freezing assets and visas to government officials uh, from Venezuela involved in, uh, in human rights abuses or abuse of power. Uh, and we have also been uh, encouraging the European Union and Latin American democracies to, to do exactly the same. So, um, uh, on the contrary, I don't think uh, the international community should be passively watching what is happening in Venezuela. Um, uh, our, my understanding, my, my, my position is that given the diagnosis, the assessment of the uh, deplorable human rights record of Venezuela and the fact that this is not going to change unless there is sufficient international pressure, my view is that we are doing exactly what needs to be done according to international law to address conditions in Venezuela. Uh, obviously, we are not uh, promoting a coup d'etat. Uh, or the use of uh, military forces 
uh, to address this, uh, this issue because uh, I don't think uh, uh, the evidence uh, under international law today uh, could justify that type of uh, uh, action from the international community under current rules of international law. There's two questions, one, two, three. Let's take three at a time. Uh, Lisa, no, one second, here. No, Aki. So, um, in the same idea, in the same order of idea, don't you think, Mr. Miguel, that uh, the international system has failed regarding Venezuela? I mean, we have seen resolutions, we have seen the international pressure that you have mentioned, we have seen the United Nations, the Organization of American States, the Lima Group, um, the sanctions uh, issued by the United States and, and by uh, Canada, particularly here in the, in, in the continent, but the situation remains the same. So, don't you think that the international system somehow has failed the international human rights system? And if you think so, what do you think is it is going to be useful to address the situation in Venezuela in order to change the behavior of the government or to change the government and the regime in, in, in the country? Let, let's take three questions that way. Back there? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for the conversation today. Uh, unilateral and international coalitions. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, try again. Unilateral and international coalitions have already and can coordinate military operations other than war. This is important to promote peace, support civil authorities, and humanitarian assistance. As you have already mentioned, and some of the uh, focus points on this military operations other than war are resolving crises, including uh, natural and man-made disasters. In this case, it is very clear, pointed out in the report by the OAS for Crimes Against Humanity, that the Nicolás Maduro narco regime has induced humanitarian crisis and has weaponized starvation and medicine scarcity. The consequences of this weaponization to remain in control have caused the suffering and death and will cost this year approximately 500,000 people. And these are the data comes from the Venezuelan Medical Federation when it says that one person dies in hospitals due to medicine scarcity every 90 seconds, that's more than 300,000 people. And also by Caritas where it mentions the, per the, the possibility of perishing 288,000 children due to malnutrition. Now, because you were mentioning international law, in this regard, the responsibility to protect doctrine, which includes genocide, like you have already mentioned in one of your, of your tweets, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. As you were mentioning today, six countries are adhering themselves to the OAS report and the claim as well as to the United Nations High Commissioner's report. Now, my question is very clear. When is a timely decisive response from the international community? And in your opinion, what is the threshold to intervene to, uh, for the humanitarian intervention? When is enough enough? Are we waiting for another soft uh, one? <laughs> <laughs> It was on the military intervention of the And mine will be easier. <laughs> so recently the president of Spain made some statements saying that uh, blaming the exodus of people from Venezuela on the US sanctions. I don't know what you think of such statement. And also his attempts to bring peace, or like to start the dialogue between the opposition and the government. You mean the former president? Sorry, the former, yeah. Uh, no. Because the current president is, uh, the head of the state is uh, Pedro Sanchez. You are referring to Rodriguez Zapatero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right? Sorry. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's try to answer this, uh, this question. So number one, whether the international community has failed in the case of Venezuela? Um, I think the international community has been pretty slow but I don't think it has failed in the case of Venezuela. It has been actually very slow. And that is not an accident. 
I mean, we need to look at the reality and, uh, and analyze this one from a geopolitical perspective. First of all, bear in mind that governments don't make decisions and, uh, and conduct foreign policy as human rights activists. You know, they have uh, a much more complex and sometimes pressing, pressing, political pressing concerns and interests than human rights. Human rights, what we do in Human Rights Watch is to try to persuade governments in the world to take human rights seriously and to make sure that there is a serious component on the human rights foreign policy, uh, let's say, of the US government or the European Union or any uh, decent government who um, at least pretend to have um, um, concern and interest in the promotion of human rights all over the world. But it's not, that is not the only interest. You know, um, governments make decisions based on mostly geopolitics. And, and if we don't recognize that Venezuela is, unfortunately, is a unique case because it's national resources and the capacity of Venezuela to influence the region, to buy support, like they have been able to successfully uh, buy support in the Caribbean. Half of the Caribbean is has been historically more than half, most of the Caribbean, with some few exceptions, um, have been on the side of Maduro and, and Chavez. Only now, probably, there is, you know, half of them are um, uh, uh, in bed with the government of Venezuela. And that prevents the Organization of American States, for instance, to apply the Democratic Charter to Venezuela, because you need a, you know, support, you need the votes, and the votes are not there yet. And why is that? Because, you know, the, Venezuela has been able to uh, use its uh, muscle and oil, oil diplomacy, to uh, buy support. And um, that makes the case of Venezuela much more difficult. However, and this is a big however, I'm not aware of an example in this region in this hemisphere of a government that is under more pressure historically than the Venezuelan government today. I don't think that even Pinochet, who deserved you know, maximum attention and pressure, and the military juntas in Argentina, or Fujimori when he was running uh, Peru, uh, are under the pressure and attention that the international community is providing today, not yesterday, today, to Venezuela, the European Union, Canada, the, the US, and the Lima Group, you know, um, um, in an effort to fully isolate and to treat this government as a pariah and calling a dictatorship. You know? So, um, in my view, uh, there is today um, um, a lot of attention, fortunately, and pressure on that regime. Now, that is not good enough. I mean, it's not, uh, you're not going to, I don't think you would be able to dramatically improve conditions in Venezuela without uh, a domestic uh, mobilization, without peaceful demonstrations, without civil disobedience domestically, which is not happening in Venezuela. You know, it happened last year. It was extremely costly, it was brutally repressed. You know, from March or February, March actually, until June. And the record uh, we have published about that, uh, those atrocities, as a matter of fact, that is one of our, the main documents that we have been provided to the ICC mm -hmm. to assess the human rights conditions. And we were, we were able to, to produce this report together with Foro Penal, which is a very, very reliable and prestigious organization in Venezuela. So. Um, I don't see improvement in Venezuela if you have only pressure from outside Venezuela, to be perfectly frank and honest with you. And uh, this needs to be um, um, uh, supported domestically uh, by Venezuelans who are willing to and able to challenge uh, peacefully 
uh, the government of uh, the dictatorship in Venezuela. And um, uh, let me link that one with the question about the, uh, the Spanish uh, uh, former head of state, who is, uh, I think is, you know, I really, frankly, I, it's hard for me to understand his position. Uh, he, he, every day, he looks more like a member of the government of President uh, Maduro, <laughs> rather than an independent uh, uh, political figure trying to address the real problems of Venezuela. And to argue that uh, the um, humanitarian crisis of Venezuela is suffering is a result of the uh, selective sanctions imposed by the uh, European Union, the US, and, and others on, on individuals who have been engaging in, uh, in, uh, in abuse of power, it, it makes no real, no, no real sense. Now, um, with regard to the, um, the uh, use of um, uh, force and the, the responsibility to protect principle, uh, responsibility to protect principle is um, is, as you say, a doctrine that has been recently developed um, at the UN level during the uh, times of uh, uh, Kofi Annan. And uh, in any way, as, I mean, one of the reasons that triggered that, um, that doctrine was the passivity of the world uh, with the genocide that happens in, in Rwanda. Uh, so bearing that one in mind, um, the, uh, the international community agree that in cases of uh, genocide, which is not the case of Venezuela, uh, in cases of uh, war crimes or ethnic cleansing or you know uh, crimes against humanity, um, and, and when uh, uh, other remedies, other options have failed or are likely to fail and when um, um, military options uh, are um, is likely to uh, military options is likely to to produce uh, more benefit than harm to the population, the international community has the responsibility to uh, prevent or stop um, uh, conditions of um, um, uh, you know mass slaughter you know of civilian population. Um, uh, we are normally not in that, in, in, as a human rights organization, we are not in that type of um, a business of, uh, of establishing when it's possible to use military force or not. We haven't done, for instance, we haven't made that call in Syria, you know, uh, which is, as you know, a country that is going through a, uh, not only a war, but devastation, complete devastation. And um, uh, it is a very complex issue. And, um, and we are concerned with the, um, the uh, uh, you know, rushing to conclusions or taking some um, position in an individual case that will end up um, uh, uh, losing uh, the, the force and the meaning and the value of those type of principles. So uh, our position is that um, what the international community is doing to address the problem of Venezuela is today uh, the right options, to use the right options under current international law. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, I, I'm currently conducting research comparing uh, political regimes in uh, Venezuela and Turkey, and I'm also looking at Poland. Uh, and I think uh, most of the questions are, you know, basically, you know, saying when does the international community uh, define a government as a criminal government? Uh, you know, this uh, this is what I'm hearing uh, from these questions, and I do understand. You look at you know at, uh, as the human rights abuses. I mean, that's your you know uh, focus. But then, uh, can uh, human rights organizations also uh, look uh, at uh, you know the offensive on the part of the government, and especially 
when they resort to vigilantism, you know, when they use sure. part, and which you also mentioned, you know, the delinquents you said, and when governments actually uh, are in collaboration with paramilitary, sure. you know, uh, groups in large numbers. I mean, this is this constitutes a crime, isn't it? And of usually, usually, you know, they actually. I mean, in the Turkish case, there was this enabling act, for instance. Well, uh, they don't pass laws anymore. You know, they have, uh, actually these are executive decrees, right? Uh, in December 2017, for instance, you know, basically enabling, uh, you know, vigilantism. So I wonder if there were such enabling uh, acts in the Venezuelan case, uh, because you know, don't they constitute a crime in a way? Um, well, it's unlikely that uh, any of the uh, surrounding countries are going to intervene in uh, Venezuela on the basis of r 2 p but they could intervene on the basis that uh, Venezuela uh, constitutes a security threat to the region. Uh, that, that would provide them sufficient grounds. I don't know when it's going to reach that point, if ever. Louis Magro hinted at that, in fact, last month, but the other countries didn't seem to support it. Uh, but I'm still wondering about the roots of corruption uh, in the country and whether that isn't feeding into human rights violations. And It's kind of a vicious circle, where I, how, how you can break one without the other. If you can't you know, root out this intractable corruption that uh, plagues almost every country in Latin America, then you're going to continue to see these uh, perpetual human rights abuses out here. Let me, so, uh, let, let me ask a last question before I turn it to you. Um, um, it, the question is about this legality of military intervention and so on. I, I wrote a piece in January of this year and my, my argument was that uh, in the Venezuelan National Assembly, which is uh, constituted, if it had the constitutional power to remove Maduro uh, and appoint uh, a new president, and if that new president gave orders to the armed forces which were not obeyed by those armed forces, that president would be free to call for military assistance to reestablish the constitution, and that that would not involve any international decision in the same way as the participation of Russia and Syria does not involve any international decision because it's at the request of a legitimately constituted government that they want that to happen that way. So my question to you is, from a legal point of view, uh, does that form, form of military intervention break any international laws? Look, um, with regard to uh, uh, the uh, military intervention um, in different contexts, normally we don't take a position on the use of um, uh, military force. Uh, we don't take even position on the use of military force for war um, because we are not in conditions or there is nothing, no grounds in international law to, to justify or to, to evaluate whether the use of force is justifiable under certain conditions. You know? And um, that is part of the problem. So we prefer to um, to stay clear from that type of judgment, um, if there is tomorrow a war anywhere in the world, um, I can assure you, or, or the use of military force, I can assure you that uh, that uh, every party is going to have what they believe are reasonable justifications for uh, using force. So normally, we since international law doesn't provide us with clear guidelines, in which case is possible, except for the responsibility to protect, which is, uh, as we understand, is, is, um, is reserved for extreme cases. Um, um, and there is no ground, for instance, for humanitarian, for intervention, use of military intervention on humanitarian grounds, uh, unless we are dealing with ethnic cleansing. In other words, uh, specifically those conditions specified there. Now, um, in the example that uh, that you 
that you gave that, actually we have no, no opinion. We would not argue that this is, it becomes at the end of the day, maybe a, 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 a legitimate uh, domestic debate about the constitu constitutionality of those type of, uh, of actions. Um, but, uh, but I don't think we have a mandate to engage in that type of uh, in that type of debate because my, my 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 rules are you know rules um, established under international humanitarian law or international human rights law. Um, but in your understanding, it would not uh, constitute a violation or anything because it's not the international community imposing its will against a nation state or a nation state inviting military assistance. Right. Um, again, our, our position is that this has nothing to do with sovereignty. In other words, whether you are violating sovereignty or not, because under the principles of the, of the um, responsibility to protect, you could forget about sovereignty if there is an, an imminent or already ongoing case of ethnic cleansing. And if there is sufficient evidence, this is a question of evidence. This is not an academic question. This is a question in that of case, you are forced to intervene uh, in spite of the fact that it's a sovereign state. Of course. Right. Of course. But, but here, it would be a sovereign state inviting uh, military assistance. So it should not trigger any, any issue. There's, there's no threshold. Uh, you know, if there's an earthquake in your country and you need military assistance, you can invite anybody to help you, right? So, I mean, a country is, 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 is free to invite anybody to their country. Right. So, so that would not, what, what, what makes it a complicated issue uh, in the case of an invasion is that, you know, what are the grounds for a state or a group of states to impose themselves on another state? if there is no deep humanitarian reason to do it. Right. But in this case, it would not be to impose yourself on another state, it would just be at the invitation of another state. Right. Now, well, look, I, um, I, I don't have evidence because this is a, um, a, a domestic issue. A, not only a domestic issue, I don't think you will find also a precedent in international law. Um, and obviously, if you find a, a single precedent, you will have a precedent where the international community very likely will be divided into which one is uh, the, uh, the, the, the legitimate uh, uh, authority or, 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 or power running that country. So, frankly speaking, I don't know what to, uh, what type of, um, I mean, I, I don't have an answer for that one. So, um, with regard to the, um, to the uh, complicity between uh, civilians and uh, well, there is enough uh, uh, evidence, not only in Venezuela, um, uh, probably the best case on point is Colombia in Latin America. Um, of, uh, and recently, uh, Nicaragua under Ortega, where uh, uh, thugs of uh, you know, delinquents who are linked with the government have a license to, to commit all sorts of crimes without any kind of accountability. Now, is, um, is that happening, or has this evidence that happens in Venezuela? For sure, we have documented that kind of relationship. Uh, that makes uh, the uh, record of uh, Venezuela, you know, um, subject of additional international scrutiny and criticism, of course. But I don't know what kind of consequence you could draw from that type of, um, that type of assessment. And with regard to the... Um, uh, Venezuela representing um, a security uh, threat for for the region and the connection between uh, human rights and corruption. Uh, usually, uh, there is a, a, a clear link between uh, abuse of power, which is essentially uh, um, corruption, and, and human rights abuses. But um, but the difference in the case of Venezuela compared to other countries that are suffering and going through a serious uh, scandals of uh, corruption is that here you have uh, a, a, a country that is, uh, uh, I mean, let me put it this way, human rights violations in Venezuela are the result of an official policy. In other words, it's the government of Venezuela 
the, the one who decides what is legal, what is illegal, what is allowed, what is not allowed. You know? uh, and in addition, you have corruption of all sorts. Of, you know? um, we don't research on corruption, but we are fully aware that, uh, that there is uh, the corruption uh, at a massive level in Venezuela. And, and the main reason why you have those kind of abuses is because there is no independent judiciary. If you don't have any, any sort of accountability on security forces and the government, on civilians who are taking advantage of this, uh, these conditions in Venezuela, obviously you have, you have this, uh, this, uh, this type of um, very, very deplorable uh, record. Now, whether this is going to the Venezuelan case, going back to the Venezuelan case, is going to be um, it's going to become a, a, a security issue for the region. Frankly, I don't know. It's not my, my area. Uh, that is something that needs to be eventually assessed by the uh, Security Council of the United Nations, uh, which is hard uh, for them to do this because uh, don't ever forget that uh, Russia and China are permanent members of the Security Council. So uh, it's essentially a um, a political decision. Well, uh, thank you very, very much. We are a little bit of our time, but I, the fact that people have stayed in the door at 240 years classes and so on, it's an indication of how much they appreciate your comments and so on. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. No, and thank you for the work you